So hello and welcome, dear colleagues, dear friends out there from around the world, episode 43. And this time with a really, not only special guest, but a really close friend, Ronnie Jung. And it's Switzerland against Switzerland. <laughs> and it's a really... They're not that far away from each other, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not only a pleasure. Ronnie, first of all, congratulations to your new, to your new job position, but we will talk about that. So... Uh, Let's stop with the congrats this, at this moment and jump right into the discussion because I know that there are many people out there who want to listen to you, who want to know about more what you're doing and your plans and everything. So we'll jump right into the first question for all out there who don't know who Ronnie is. Ronnie, tell us a little bit more about you and your career and take your time to spend a few minutes to talk how how you have reached this goal i think this was a, always a goal of you to become head of a dental clinic um, i don't know I, I i have the feeling it always was so ronnie the stage is yours thank you so much uh, alessandro i think this is one of the nicest things i've ever done uh, uh, being uh, with such a close friend and it's really true what alessandro said we are really close and uh, I think there's nobody which I work closer uh, from a, also from a patient perspective uh, uh, than with you, Alessandro. So this is a, a trust based on many years of friendship. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of your uh, legendary uh, uh, talk show, so to say. I didn't know that you have already so many episodes, so congratulations. So personally, you told me I can really kind of dig a little bit into the, into the past. So uh, my name is Ronald Young. I'm uh, born in uh, in Zurich, and I spent my childhood and my uh, uh, being a teenager primarily on the soccer field because I played uh, 12 years for a, a professional soccer team here in Switzerland. Uh, there are two teams in Zurich, and one of them is called Grasshopper. The, the Swiss people, they do know it, but the other one, they, they might not. Uh, it's still the, the, the team which has won the most championship in Switzerland and I was, uh, I was I'm happy to have two of them as a junior uh, which I uh, was able to uh, be two times a Swiss championship with them. So this was basically my career and after that I wanted to become an architect that was also very clear because I was part of, um, of uh, the building of a house of my father and I really admired it so much and uh, I, I was clear First being a soccer career and then becoming an architect. But as many things in life, things can go completely in different directions. So um, when I was when I finished my, um, my gymnasium, the high school here in Switzerland with uh, 18 years, I uh, got then a professional contract at the soccer team. And this didn't last that long. So because after three months, I got a very serious leg injury and I had to do five times surgery of my lower leg. And now I'm missing 15 centimeters of my fibula. And I uh, can still, at the moment, I can do actually everything I want because the fibula has no static function. But obviously this first dream uh, um, couldn't become true anymore because uh, uh, with that you cannot become a professional soccer player. But then I was so in touch with, uh, with all the medical environment then I got really interested uh, into medicine and I said, listen, I'm sick and tired of always being horizontal in the operation room. I want to once be vertical uh, in the operation room. So I started to study medicine with the aim to become an orthopedic surgeon. And then again, things change. Uh, a father of a close friend of mine, um, Donat and Andreas Grimm, uh, he was a pioneer in GBR in the dentistry here in Switzerland. And he was such a passionate and positive uh, personality. And he said, listen, forget about becoming an orthopedic surgeon because you anyway will end up just being a specialist for shoulder or for knee or whatever. Dentistry has many, many more things to offer. It's not just about function. It's about the aesthetic. It's about the social interaction. It's about being so close in one a sensitive area with the patient. And he really motivated me so much that I changed from dental school to medical school. And so that's how I became a dentist. This is kind of the, the old version then, Alessandro. Should I go even further or do you want to kind of uh, target? 
is only the beginning of your career. So we want. <laughs> so we are really curious yeah, about the, the real stuff now. <laughs> so let, let let let's talk about the next steps of your career. When uh, after after you studied dentistry, also in Zurich at the at the Zurich exactly. Dental School. That's right. Exactly. exactly. And, and what happened then? And then I, uh, on one hand, I started in the oral surgery department, was in the uh, uh, private practice of Claude Andreoni, a famous uh, Swiss dentist. And then I uh, said, okay, I, uh, I really want to understand better uh, reconstructive dentistry and, uh, and kind of prosthetics. And then I went to Pete the Scherer's department as a postgraduate student. And... Um, he made me after almost only one year actually being a, a member of the faculty there. So this was, I was the, the junior there. And like this, I, I stayed there. And, um, and then I started to become more interested in, uh, in research and so on. And uh, continued then with Christoph Hemmerle, uh, which was then the, the successor of Peter Scherer in Zurich for the uh, restorative uh, department. And then I had, I spent, Actually, before I spent one year in Los Angeles, then I spent one year in uh, in San Antonio, Texas, with David Cochran, and then I finalized my habilitation. This is a, a German thing in Europe. Uh, uh, other people might not know this, but it's like a little bit more an extensive uh, PhD. But I also did then a PhD in uh, in uh, Amsterdam with Daniel Wiesmeyer in 2011. And then I got um, a visiting professorship at Harvard Dental School with Herman Gallucci and H.P. Uh, Weber. And after that, I returned back, went into uh, private practice as a, as a partner with Uli Grunder and Dave Schneider. But doing this, the university kind of offered me the position of uh, being uh, the head of the implant department at the University of Zurich at the Department of Reconstructive Dentistry. So I, uh, uh, I was then really kind of, again, attached to, to this new challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Uli Grunder and uh, Dave Schneider really supported me very nicely and very well. And then I went back to university, getting this professorship for infantology. And now, and uh, Alessandro is really very right, since uh, last Friday, uh, the... Uh, uh, the board of directors of the university, including then also kind of uh, the, the, the government in, in, Switz, in Zurich, uh, appointed me to become then chairman and clinic director of the Clinic of Reconstructive Dentistry. So I will become then the successor of Christoph Hamerle. So I'm in the role of Peter Scherer, Christoph Hamerle, and now myself after the 1st of February 2022. And this is now really a big, uh, yeah, big thing, and I'm really, really, really happy. So I, I, I also have to say, and you know that very well, Alessandro, I worked hard for that, and uh, it, uh, in this position, it gets not just about the performance, it's also very political, and from that point of view, I'm really very thrilled and happy about that. And we all are really proud of you, Ronnie. And, oh, that's really sweet. I, I'm, really, I'm really proud because uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against any... German, Italian, French, Austrian, American, or wherever professors, but I I really love that we get some uh, some fresh fresh Swiss blood also at the university to to get to get a good mix, let's say an educational mix, a social mix, and not and not leading into just one direction or moving away from some let's say Swiss qualities we have experienced uh, over the last decade. So when I was when I was a student, uh, I think we we almost had all professors all or almost all professors were Swiss. So the the, the Zurich Dental School was basically a Swiss institution, and and uh, over over the time it changed into like a German German institution and again nothing against German professors but um, bringing back some some uh, some Swiss tradition uh, that's my personal opinion my personal opinion yeah. I like it that we get some fresh blood into into the Swiss universities and I can tell you our oldest son working at Roche the big companies in Switzerland are now promoting Swiss talents because they want they want to have back Swiss people leading Swiss companies. 
um, you can you can bring in people from other countries, but uh, at the end at the end we have uh, we have a special a special tradition, a special philo philosophy how we are um, handling things, handling problems, and uh, I, I like I like that Swiss way. I'm I, although you know that my father is from Italy, my mother is from Germany, and I always tell people genetically I'm a Swiss. I grew up in Switzerland, and I feel I feel European or um, uh, um, uh, a global a global uh, person. But at the end, each country has uh, some qualities, and we have to focus on these qualities. And I think you're the you're you're the right person to take over the steps after Peter Scherer and Professor Hemmerle. So keeping up the Swiss tradition in this uh, in this Crown and Bridge department. No, I, I also can feel this uh, kind of this this support and this uh, appreciation. I, I, I have been really kind of uh, floated with so many nice messages, phone calls, uh, emails, uh, uh, on the one hand internationally, but also locally. And that really makes me very happy and proud. And I can really feel how uh, yeah, how the people are uh, are now so happy with that. So it's not something which... Uh, uh, which yeah, which people are getting jealous or whatever. So I think it's really from the bottom of the heart, people do appreciate this uh, uh, very much. And this is then a fantastic feeling because the reason why I'm doing this is basically because I am a trying to bridge person, but the main thing when I'm doing it is really trying to bridge people, uh, teams, uh, uh, universities, uh, uh, organizations, uh, industry, and so on. This is actually what's so beautiful be, uh, working at the university, having the opportunity to be in a, such an international environment. And, um, and I also feel a lot of trust and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of enthusiasm from the side of the, of the president of the university, including the, the vice presidents and the board of directors there, that they see my, me as a kind of a, a new role model in this uh, uh, medical area. And uh, this is something which really makes me very proud. Okay, that's cool. So let's jump. Uh, let's jump into the next question. You are mentioning that you were professor of a new, a new, new established uh, uh, center of implantology. And so the next question. So this implant center you built, basically supported by, uh, and uh, and as far as I remember, this was like unique in Europe that a prosto department and the surgical department agreed on not taking, taking implant dentistry on their side, but building something that is like in between the two specialties. And you were lucky to be the head of this, uh, of this division. So what happens now that you are changing position uh, from, and, and going away, let's say, from this implant center? What happens with, this, uh, with, this, with, with your baby? Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, uh, you, you mentioned something which I really would like to emphasize a little bit because I think it's really unique and, uh, and, uh, and it's based on, on trust. I think the, the magic word is always trust. And within the, the dental school at the University of Zurich, there was a lot of trust in, in me and in the, in the, in the disciplines that, uh, uh, that building up something which hasn't other built because they kind of, they spent their time primarily fighting over uh, who is, doing implantology. And I can really say also by today that we have a very uh, kind of nice and respectful way to handle these three departments, which basically, or four departments, which uh, do implants, which is the, the oral surgery, maxillofacial surgery, the, uh, the perio uh, department, and then uh, the prosthetic department. And I think we have to, uh, we have to face the fact that uh, Peter Scherer was really the one which brought this implantology into the university and, and really made there uh, brought a lot of expertise into the department of reconstructive dentistry and we find an excellent way to work together on the one hand that every of these clinics are placing implants so it's not kind of centralized but what we offer with the center of implant research is a kind of a, a cutting edge facility including professional staff orchestrating the entire workflow of, uh, of clinical research at the university and the the other clinics can use this space including the the, the study manager 
in order to perform research actually for free because the, the financial um, model behind that was or is uh, um, uh, a foundation based at the University uh, uh, of Zurich. And um, I have the pleasure to treat uh, uh, international patient. Uh, and uh, with that, I have, we have been able to, to fund uh, about 1.5 million from uh, the donation of the patient. And with this, we could, uh, we could pay all the staff in there. And like this, I could offer this service, kind of a research service to all departments within the University of Zurich. And at the beginning, this was kind of just within the University of Zurich. Now we open this, uh, uh, we offer this service also to other universities. And at the moment we have, um, it's it's Harvard in Boston, it's University of Sao Paulo, University of uh, um, uh, uh, Santiago in, um, in uh, uh, Colombia. Then it's, uh, the Beijing University, it's uh, it's uh, university in Pune in India, it's uh, Yonsei University in South Korea, and Singapore is now added on, and Ghent in Belgium, and uh, um, Barcelona is coming together. So we have now really a very international network in the most uh, interesting market areas, which we do collaboration, which we do uh, research together. And based okay. on this network, you will stay head of this implant department or you, you integrate it in your... Uh, or, it, will or... be, it will be one of the pillars uh, within the, 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 the entire clinic structure. So it will be an important pillar. And uh, uh, we also have already kind of had discussion who will then take over kind of the responsibility for that part. But it will be um, within the umbrella of the entire clinic. Okay, so this leads me to the next question. Uh, part of the question you already answered. Tell us a little bit more about the Department for Reconstructive Dentistry. And I think this is also a Swiss terminology that started some years ago, several years ago. I remember when I was... Uh, 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 Oh, this was in 2006, 15 years ago, <laughs> president of the Swiss Society of Reconstructive Dentistry. And uh, we, we tried to move away from crown and bridges to say uh, it's, it's more than just crown and bridges, what this, these departments all over the world are doing. You were mentioning implants, uh, you do adhesive dentistry, you do a lot of things. And the, the, the terminology reconstructive dentistry uh, against, let's say, restorative dentistry and reconstruction. So did the two terms fit perfectly together? And, and implant is also a reconstruction. So basically everything that is not just a filling or glued on non-invasive on a two structure, basically then is reconstructive dentist. Is that correct? Yes, I think that's the, the whole idea behind that. Uh, as you know, we have, uh, the name was for many years, the uh, Department of Crown and Bridges and, uh, and Partial Dentures and Dental Material Science. This is how also Peter Scherer's department's name was. And Christoph Hamley then took this, uh, uh, this name over. It's a good name in terms of that it describes kind of the, the, the basic principles what we are uh, offering, but it was considered not to be any more kind of modern and really uh, uh, comprehensive enough to, as you said, as you very nice described, Alessandro, what's in the department. And on the lead of Christoph Hemmerle, this has then been changed um, about, I don't know, about three, uh, three years ago or three, four years ago into a clinic of reconstructive dentistry. And I think it's a very comprehensive and short name. However, we have to face the fact that in the especially in the US, they have some difficulties to, uh, uh, to differentiate between uh, restorative and reconstructive dentistry. There, also when you look at the uh, associations, they are uh, called kind of prosthetic, prosthodontics uh, uh, associations, and nobody considers them as reconstructive there. And uh, in Switzerland, it is kind of, it fits to the Swiss Society of Reconstructive Dentistry, which I remember very well because I, I joined the board when you have been president and there was then also lucky that I, that I could also be once then the president uh, and currently I'm the past president of the Swiss Society of Reconstructive Dentistry. From that point of view, it fits. So for Swiss European situation, I think it does fit. But when we look at it more from an American point of view, it might create some confusion. 
Yeah, but maybe maybe we have to tell them what the definition what is right? <laughs> about because if, no, because I think it makes things easier to understand. Also, and, and, and non, and also, also for a non-dentist. So for yeah. our patients, if you explain to them what is a, rest a restoration and what is a reconstruction, uh, I think it's uh, it's it's, yeah, it's a good point. Actually, we should always yeah. so, uh, because I had to I had to do a lecture and I was saying uh, it's uh, restoring and uh, replacing. So uh, restoring is fixing a tooth and replacing is reconstructing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can, it's from the reconstruction of, of a building or whatever. So if you just uh, uh, do, do some small finishes, that, that's, a, re, that's a, a, a restoration and not a reconstruction. So yes. if really a lot of tooth structure is missing or the entire tooth is missing, then you have to reconstruct it. And I think for, for me, it makes completely true. sense. And it's also how I explain a patient the difference between doing a filling, yeah. adhesive dentistry, restoring, mm -hmm. repairing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not replacing. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and the gap like might... And, and I think uh, from that point, you should, you should try to convince your colleagues from other countries to take over this, this concept, which is, a, at the end, easy to understand, not only for the dental community, but also for the much larger patient community. Alessandro, I, I like your way of looking at the things. You're really right. Actually, uh, sometimes we should maybe be a little bit more self-confident in Switzerland <laughs> and say, hey, it's actually true. It's, it's really, and I liked also your description because it is, it is more comprehensive and at, at the end of the day, it, uh, it includes all these aspects which we today as a, as a modern prosthodontist, so to say, is doing. And as you say, we are not anymore just a dentist which do prosthesis, either fixed or uh, uh, removable prosthesis. Uh, and I think we have much more to offer to our patient. And usually we always look to what the Americans are doing and then we, we think we need to follow them. But you're right. Maybe we should also try to be self-confident and also uh, explain them and convince them uh, uh, that this might be uh, or is the better name for it. I, I like that, Alison. I never thought about that. <laughs> no, because I remember when I was the first time in, in the US at the conference, I was like amazed how the, the speakers are standing there and telling people I'm the greatest because I'm so good. That's why you invited me to be on stage. And this is really 200% self-confidence. Yes, that's what and we learn a lot. Self-confidence is missing in, uh, in many other countries. Maybe sometimes in the US a little bit overdone but at the end at the end it's not it's 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 correct to say okay if i invite you to be a speaker i i have the feeling or the impression that you have to tell something and then you can be proud to be to stand in front of the audience and tell them look i share my knowledge i share my wisdom and i'm not so bad otherwise i would not be here <laughs> yes yeah you're right i think this is also a european or even a, a more a swift thing that we always kind of are not self-confident enough this has maybe to do with the fact that we are a small country uh, and that we always kind of need to adapt ourselves also language wise because uh, with Swiss German, I, I won't succeed in uh, in any airport or any train station uh, in uh, in any part of the world. Uh, but you're right. I think we should we should increase our self confidence, and I really like your approach. So you're uh, you're motivated me to be a little bit more uh, self confident, and also for the for the term reconstructive dentistry. I think it's really true. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe maybe you you uh, organize a, um, a consensus meeting. Based on, on, based on that, based on that. <laughs> there, there's consensus meeting on everything. That's true. That's why, true. Why, not, why not the consensus on how, how, we, how we name the departments, how we name what we are doing also in front of, uh, of our yeah. patients? Yeah. Because That's we have to understand what we are offering. Because at the end, at the end it's, it's moving. So uh, especially if we're talking about implant dentistry, Everybody, everybody wants to claim 
to be the responsible department for implants. So the periodontists say, okay, we save teeth and the tooth and an implant are basically the same. So we are, we, we have the knowledge to do that. The endodontist says the same. Uh, the prostodontist says the same. The oral surgeon says the same. The only one who maybe do not say this are the, the conservative departments. Um, and, and, and there I see also how the appreciation of these different departments is uh, the most important department. If we look at what's happening globally, carriers is still the most, the, the most uh, common disease. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. conservative department is the most important one because they are treating the number one disease. But Absolutely. in the eye of a lot of people, uh, I remember several years ago uh, in a conference when people were asking, are you placing implants? And if you then tell no, then tell, aha, uh -huh, you're mm -hmm. not a good dentist because you're not, you're not placing implants. So, so we have to be careful not to judge on what you are doing uh, on the importance. I had a really great interview with Luis Baratieri and he got emotional at the end telling me that only prophylaxis, prophylaxis, <laughs> prophylaxis. He was like, and I told him, yeah, that, that this is what in Switzerland happened in the 60s with Martaler uh, and, 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 uh, and Mühlemann. So that prophylaxis started to be the important thing and they stated if we if we do what we have to do, we will we will cut the branch we are sitting on, and maybe in the in the near future, but it did not happen. Uh, there's no need for dentists anymore because if people take care for their teeth, uh, there's no need of, uh, of of dentists of dental treatments anymore, and this is something that should be also pushed more. So the oral health things, it's not sexy. It's not make, you cannot make a lot of money with, uh, with just cleaning teeth and telling people how to brush their teeth. But what is your, what is your vision? So this is, this is uh, what, uh, what I want to ask you next. So what are your future projects or what projects can you share with us besides the, the, the intense research you're planning on implants, these multi-center studies, what are other projects that you can share with us without being uh, or without uh, telling us things you cannot tell us? Well, number one, I have to tell you, Alison, you're a wonderful moderator. How you make these transitions between the topics, it's actually uh, it's admiring. So uh, <laughs> you got directly in that way. And I want to, before going to the future project, I would like to uh, kind of go back to the, 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 the to what you said regarding the prophylaxis and that people say this and this is like a, a cutting your own branch you're sitting on. I think thinking like this is just is the, the most short-minded uh, uh, thing you can you can do uh, in any discipline. When you just consider to keep the others small or uh, uh, whatever in order to be able to to grow, that's not the right way. Growing means growing out of strength, and that means to be always innovative. And at the end of the day, the, the main reason why we are here is really to increase oral health. But I think, and this is now goes already into your question regarding the future, uh, uh, where it does go to, is that still today we are the dentist, we are uh, the, the, uh, the only medical discipline which do see the patients once to twice a year through dental hygienist or a person, whatever. And I do believe the future dentist is a dentist which does less mechanical things. The future dentist becomes more involved into diagnostics and not just into diagnostics of uh, our two diseases, uh, let's say, uh, main diseases like caries and, uh, and periodontitis. I think we do will play a much more important role in terms of diagnosis also in, uh, in uh, general medicine. Because especially saliva diagnostics uh, is severely underestimated what can be done. Um, just now, today, we also, uh, through the whole COVID uh, crisis, uh, realizing that uh, this might be then the, the, the future standard of, uh, of, um, uh, of testing, 
that not anymore through uh, getting a, a Q-tip into your nose, that this can be uh, this can already be done in uh, uh, through saliva, but this will improve as well. So the future dentist will be more diagnostic, less uh, technical, and we will uh, we will work more not anymore at the patient itself because I think many things today taking place at the dental office will not take place anymore at the at the dental office. And now we're going to into a very interesting topic, and that's how I also looked into the future of how I would like to uh, uh, to uh, to direct uh, uh, our uh, department by thinking how does dentistry looks like in 2040, 2050. We won't work as dentists anymore, but I think it's of utmost importance to really face the realities uh, uh, and what's going to be there. And I said by then. Many things happen at home, so teledentistry is a, is a, is a thing which will uh, have a major impact. We also know that data is today the, the main value uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which companies make a lot of money out of it. And so data collection is of, of huge importance. And this leads into the area of uh, uh, so-called uh, kind of also data science which we learn much more about our body. So the patient or the, the human beings are, are much more interested about their own parameters. By having a kind of any kind of, I don't have one, but a, 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 one of these watches which monitor how much you sleep, uh, uh, how much you stress you have, uh, uh, how much calories you, you, uh, you, uh, you use. So there is a higher interest in monitoring myself. And for instance, that device which sees the patient most often is actually not the dentist and not anybody else, it's the toothbrush. So a toothbrush can be extremely important for harvesting information about the patients and can really also be not just because harvesting is just one thing, uh, it's about what you do out of this uh, out of these data. So I think dentistry becomes extremely more interesting going in direction of, uh, uh, of this is, is called uh, everything about e-health or uh, it's just dental related kind of dental e-health. This is something which is of enormous importance and, uh, and we potentially could play a role, as I said, in diagnostics. There is a lot of attempts in miniaturization of, uh, of devices, of, um, of sensors, which can be kind of implanted into the reconstructions. Now we're back at the reconstruction, which allow a 24 seven monitoring of different parameters of the patient's body situation. And I think this is where dentistry will go to. And a classic anamnesis and a, and a dental assessment as we do, I think will not be part anymore because our mobile devices, they will allow to, to already scan and visualize my mouth situation pretty accurate uh, without the need of, a, uh, of an uh, intro uh, uh, scanner. And I will receive as then this, this information beforehand. We also see now with the whole aligner technology, there is not the dentist uh, always needed anymore. So many things happen there. There might be some centers which you do a scan, which you do a combing CT. And I get all this information already beforehand and can start doing a diagnosis and, uh, and, uh, and a treatment suggest and treatment plan before I have ever seen the patient. And I think this is how it will go to. So I this is also one part which will develop. So I have, um, uh, uh, I already kind of made the plan for uh, starting a center of, uh, of dental e-health uh, in Zurich, in order to become really one of the, the nucleus in, in that area. Another area is that the optimization, so the, uh, the, the use of robotic devices will end the dentistry. It's for me still actually shocking to see that uh, we are very advanced when it comes to um, data acquisition with all the scanners, as you said. We are already pretty advanced in terms of digital diagnostics using augmented reality. And we are actually the world champion kind of in the, in the production. That means that the, the whole milling, uh, 3D printing, the, the CAD CAM procedures. But the way we get this diagnostic into patient mouth is absolutely ridiculous. That's like 200 years ago. We do it the exact same way. We have 
some using some silicon keys in order to try to visualize the form of the tooth. Now we try to use augmented reality to, to at least superimpose then the, uh, the diagnostics uh, onto the tooth. But still, the execution of what we did meticulously on diagnostics by the patient, by the dentist, is dependent on so many factors which are totally uncontrolled. I have a good friend of mine, which is um, a pilot of the um, Boeing uh, 777. Here it is the biggest uh, airplane uh, what the Swiss uh, company has. And he said that about five to 10% is still flying mechanically. The rest is uh, uh, optimization. And from that point of view, I think this will also change the industry in a very significant way. And again, that, and again, we, we should never think of, oh my God, I cannot drill holes anymore in the patient. That's absolutely ridiculous. We are actually not, we don't go through a five year study in order to drill holes into patients. We actually trained at the dental schools and the medical schools in order to become excellent doctors with a lot of skills, number one, social skills, number two, diagnostic skills, and then being able to do the, the, the respective treatment planning. That's why we became dentists or, uh, or medical doctors. Yeah, but uh, what, what I see and over the last years, uh, I tried also or, or was in contact with a lot of companies uh, with some uh, augmented reality, virtual reality projects I'm working on. And I felt a little bit resistant against real innovation in the companies. And the, the dental companies are adapting to their clients, which are the dentists. And the average dentist is not a person who is ready to invest a lot of money, who is ready to invest a lot into education. So um, we have to face it. Um, many dentists reach their top level of dentistry when they go out of dental school. And from there, the curve goes slowly down until they retire. And we have to face that. So only a small part of dentists are really motivated to to push forward to invest also in their offices they 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 don't change their chairs uh, yeah this will last another five years and my equipment will last another five years oh i learned that 25 years ago i will stay with that so i'm really happy that you are telling us that you want to innovate and this is then the question in part you answered that already but we have the second part of the question and this is about dental education. I love your ideas and your vision of the future of dentistry. Now, the second, the second part is motivating the dentists to join, your, join, the, join the ride, jump on the train and head to the future. This is not easy, I tell you, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that you can, uh, you can do your part for that. But what about dental education? What I have seen from outside the university is that the dental education, especially the practical part, has dropped down uh, after the Bologna reform. So we have more intelligent students. They know, they know a lot of theory, but are less practical trained that, for example, my generation was or even your generation was. So how do you face this fact of producing young dentists. Um, we could also talk about why, why uh, we have now 80% women at the dental schools and less men, but this is another topic. Let's stay on this dental education. Uh, we can say 20 years ago, after finishing dental school, you, it, it was like having a, a, a uh, an elere, I don't know what it's in English. <laughs> the regular education. Then, uh, yeah. An apprenticeship uh, or learn the job. And then you have to train yourself to get more comfortable, to get, uh, to get exercised with it. But how do you face this new situation? What are you telling uh, your students? Or what is your vision of dental education in the future? Mm-hmm. Well, then number one, what you said, uh, I, I, I do know and I do, uh, I'm also confronted by that, that, uh, that the criticism about the students today is the fact that they uh, don't get enough exposure to the different uh, uh, kind of uh, practical work. And I'm 
you know me very well, so I'm, a, I'm really as a, I mean, in my heart, not just a, a university professor, I'm a very strong uh, private practitioner in my heart. Uh, I think uh, you're, uh, you can definitely uh, confirm this. So I know exactly that uh, uh, this dilemma there. But I do have to say now being putting another head on as a, as a university person, I, I do have to see the emphasis needs to be to really educate our dentist. Now we don't talk about the form, but we talk about now just uh, uh, what they should reach in a way that, as I said, that they become modern dentists, modern uh, medical doctors, which have uh, uh, great abilities in diagnostics and, and also using these all these tools. And the challenge will be to still stay on the level of having sufficient exposure to uh, the practical work. Because this goes not hand in hand. So because on the one hand, uh, and it's the same for you and for me, I think the, the whole uh, material which we had to learn at the time when we were at dental school was significantly less in volume, so to say, uh, than it is today, which is also the beauty of, uh, of our profession. And I, I still think that dentistry is an amazing profession. And I, I go to work every day with a, uh, with a big smile and being very happy because I, I do also see the progression. But I think the, the future learning will change because a, a major thing today is the so-called kind of um, more tailored learning. When, when, let's say, you are excellent in the mathematics and, uh, and, uh, and I'm excellent in, uh, in French, and we go to school together, we have both four hours mathematics and four hours of French. And you are always bored sitting in the mathematic lesson, but you, have, uh, you don't understand anything in the French. And I'm the other way around. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very good in French, uh, uh, understanding everything, but I have no idea about mathematics. But we still go to get it to, to school in, in the same amount. So the future of learning, and that will, that's already kind of happening, is that a student, also, also when he goes to, to preschools and there, and, and, uh, and kind of uh, the first six years or whatever, will be more tailored. That means that you can customize your education more to the needs you have. And at the universe, that means that you have uh, kind of self-assessment centers where you can challenge yourself on a regular basis, identifying the weaknesses of my, uh, of my education. So that's, I say, okay, I'm very bad in endodontics. I have no idea what they're talking about. And uh, I, I never get this, uh, this shit needle into the, uh, into the uh, uh, tooth canal, a root canal. And then I could, I could invest more of my time into endodontic treatment, but I'm very good in, um, I don't know, uh, preparing crowns or whatever. So the future of dentistry and the future in, uh, in general of education will go more in this direction, having this, uh, this tailored-based learning. And this is obviously, now we come to the second part of the question, this is obviously only possible by including more kind of online education activities there. Then not just on a theoretical part, but also on a practical part. So kind of haptic uh, uh, aspects become an important issue that you don't need to have a patient in order to train now how to do a root canal treatment, that uh, the simulation things like uh, the, the pilots do uh, uh, on a very regular basis. So they, they, they have every, uh, uh, every month, they have a couple of days where they just are going to the simulator, training and training and training and getting different uh, aspects of what they could face when they are in the air. And the same thing will be with, uh, with, uh, with the denti dental students, because at the moment, you know it very well, Alessandro. We went to the patients doing things which we had actually no idea about doing that. <laughs> and that's not really how it should be. Maybe we were afterwards, we were really proud uh, that we did it. And then at the end of the dental school, we said, hey, I did so many crowns, so many root treatments. But it's actually not on the level as we consider today a modern education. So what I want is then, then that through simulation of the patient, because you basically could do everything what you will do then in this specific specific patient you could already simulate beforehand we have started to do uh, also education uh, uh, continuing education courses in implantology by not anymore using just a, a ridiculous plastic model uh, drilling an implant in there so what we did is uh, the patient i'm i'm operating 
then uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of the study and uh, the course of the, of the education program, the same patient is going to be then 3D printed a model. So the dentists which are doing the practical part, they're doing actually the same thing as I will do a couple of hours later than live at the patient. So they, they get the feeling of being challenged by the by the bone defect, by the, ana, uh, by the anatomic situation there, in order to be really closer to this uh, uh, to the to the situation. So to come to kind of uh, to conclude on that, number one, the most important part it will be more tailored through the through the use of modern technology and modern uh, online education, not just theoretical, also practical. We will be able to manage to also educate the dentist more from a practical point of view in order to meet the expectations which are there, which are out there uh, by, the, by the practitioner to have then uh, a future uh, dentist which graduated from dental school by having also a sufficient um, knowledge about the practical part. Very interesting. Great. So uh, let's come to the last question. And that's a question I always ask at the end. And it's, I think, one of the most important questions. What advice can you give to young colleagues? So uh, as, as a, you are now a young teacher and, uh, and there are many young colleagues out there who are struggling. First, should I, should I become a dentist today? Or uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm a dentist, what are, the, what are my next steps? Uh, what should be my goal with all these clinics popping up and uh, the situation changing? As I told you, the switch also becoming a female profession. So what, are, what, what, what advice can you give young colleagues as a conclusion of our live discussion? Two things. Number one, stay always open and don't try to foresee what you will do or what is uh, going to happen. And number two, stay always enthusiastic about what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, it's not about a specific profession. It's about your own attitude, whether you're going to be happy in your profession or not. I could have the most amazing job, most amazing position, earning a, a lot of money. But when I'm not having this attitude of being grateful uh, for what I, uh, what I have, I will be never happy. So from that point of view, this is the main thing, staying open, staying enthusiastic. Dentistry is a wonderful profession because it does open a lot of doors. And these are the two factors I feel in you already for many years. I think we know each other for 20 years now. And I'm really proud to be your friend. And uh, I already told you I'm, uh, I'm working for more than 20 years already at the, at the dental school. And uh, I already told Professor Atin that uh, if, if, <laughs> if, you, if, you can, uh, if you can be the successor of Professor Hemmele, I would also love to collaborate with you on some projects. Uh, I, have, I have some ideas, I have some visions, and uh, would, would, I would love to share that with, uh, with you and uh, with, with the young students, so, because this is also one of my passion, sharing knowledge. This is something that I also don't feel enough in our profession. So many dentists are close, they're, they're closed up in their dental offices and get depressive. And uh, I'm, I'm not really feeling the passion or the fun of the profession. They should open the doors and get yes. out and communicate with each other. And, and, and that's also my activities on social media or doing these interviews. Let's, let's communicate. Let's talk to each other. It's a small world. It's a, it's a very short time we are here on that planet. And let's have fun and make the best out of it. So I, I think this is my message. Maybe you can give your message to end, to summarize or end up this live interview, Ronnie. I think I, I, I brought it already to the point because I, I do believe uh, when also when people sometimes think uh, Ronnie's career has been very much, he also pointed out that it was always the goal. And I tell you the truth, that was never really the goal. Because when you really look carefully to my, uh, uh, to my entire career, things have changed so many times and it never became the way as I actually expected. Uh, my main goal is really to be really happy at every day going to work because we spend so much time at work and uh, uh, being passionate about, about what you're doing. And that's not about that much important what you're doing. It's the fact that you're passionate about what you're doing. 
that's uh, that's a great conclusion, Ronnie Young. Thank you very much for for being my guest yeah, and yeah. Look forward. And I again congratulations to to all your achievements. But now after the congratulations, <laughs> it's 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 the job that awaits you. And uh, I'm sure that we you will fulfill this job and uh, do a great job and bring the dental school and dentistry ahead. So this should also be one of your goals. And uh, if, if we can help you, we are ready to help. Super. That's great to hear. Thank you very much, Alessandro. You did an amazing job and I feel very honored and, and, and happy to be part of your, uh, of your live discussion. Thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.